Amen. Give it up for the band this morning leading us. Thank you guys. Thank y'all. Man, I'm with Dr. Strong. I absolutely love this time that we have together and uh, have missed it over the break. I do hope that you got to take a nap and uh, goof off and watch TV and do all those kinds of things because that's over. It's time to study, right? If you have a Bible, turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 1. The book of James chapter 1 is where we want to be together this morning. Um, yeah, all kidding aside, let's start the semester. It's time to get after it. It's time to work hard. It's time to dig in. Remember what the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes. There is a time under the sun for everything, right? Right now, it's time to dig in and study and take the semester seriously. And uh, I want to just encourage you along that lines. Uh, you did this last semester better. I've been in a school like this my entire adult life, okay? And you did last semester something I have never seen done. You, you stayed in this moment with us. We asked you, we urged you, we challenged you to take this chapel moment very seriously, to make it a top priority so that you don't just blow it off because you're always going to have things that need to be read. You're always going to have things that need to be written. You're always going to have work that needs to be done. But just speaking to the family for a moment, not just our students and our faculty, but our employees, our staff, there is nothing we will do each day, each week, each month, and each year than seek the Lord. And so I just want to urge you, take this seriously. Staff, you're welcome to stop and come on in, talk to your supervisor about how to plan all that. But I want NOBTS, the family, coming together and stopping our, from the normal rhythms of our life and just sing to the Lord, pray to the Lord, seek the Lord. So you did that last semester better than I've ever seen in my adult life in a school like this. I want to ask you to do that again. When we come into these moments, let's put our cell phones away, let's put aside the distractions, and let's come and sing as people that just need the Lord. Let's pray as people that need the Lord. Let's open the Word together as a people that need the Lord. And let the Lord strengthen us and do a great work in us. And so I'm excited for the semester we've got in front of us, and I'm excited to be with you here today. James chapter 1. I want to speak to us about trials. Now, all semester long and all year long, we're going to talk to you about our mission. We're going to talk to you about taking the gospel to the nations. We're going to talk to you about gospel proclamation. We're going to talk about all those types of things. But today I want to talk to us about trials. Because if I know anything about seminary students in the middle of a semester, it's this. You are going to grow tired. You are going to grow weary. It's becoming much bigger of a thing in the life of really all people, but especially students in this phase, that you got stuff happening in your life, you got difficulties coming your way, you got all kinds of stresses and anxieties, and you grow weary, you grow weak, and you just reach this point where you're at your wit's end. How many of you have been there in the last year? Raise your hand. That's an awful lot of us. And guess what? It's very likely to happen again this semester, right? So what do you do about that? What do you do about that? I'm going to ask us to do something a little different. I've done this once before in chapel. I want to do it again today. I know normally we just read the text, I pray, and we get to it. But I really want us today, as a people, just to listen to the Word of God and consider it together today uh, and be as pastoral as we can possibly be. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just for a moment, I want us to silence our hearts and still our minds, and I'm going to ask you a simple question, and then I'm going to read over you. So take a moment and just get still, and then consider the question I'm about to ask you. With an open heart and mind before the Lord, let me ask you this question. What's stressing you out? And what do you think you're supposed to do about it? What's stressing you out? And what do you think you're supposed to do about it? Listen to this. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And now instructs us, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But if let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts will be like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Father, as a people, we come to you. You've called us. And this very room is a people that have answered that call and have given themselves to preparation and hard work and to the training so that they can now take the gospel into the darkness. Lord, that's who we are. And we're so grateful that you love us and you've called us. Honestly and transparently before you here this morning, Lord, we often grow weary. We often are overwhelmed. We often are tried and tested in various ways. And Lord, if we're honest, there's a lot of moments where we just want to quit. So I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd strengthen our souls, and that, God, you would make your people strong, that we would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God, accomplish that in us and give us the wisdom to know how to do it. We give ourselves to you. I pray that you'd minister this morning to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what's stressing you out, and what do you think you ought to do about it? Again, I've already said this, but if I know anything about seminary students, if I know anything about a seminary community, even faculty and staff, man, if we've heard anything over the last year, this is what we've heard. I mean, you think about the last couple years, it's always stressful. Listen, God has called us to work that's not just difficult. He's called us to work that, quite frankly, is impossible. You and I are tasked with taking the gospel into the darkness and being a part of seeing lives transformed and changed. That's quite frankly not something I'm able to do or you're able to do, right? We're called into work that's very difficult and then you add to that the factors and the dynamics of the last few years that have only exacerbated that and amplified that in every last one of our lives. And so over the last year, what Thomas, we have heard again and again and again about how our students are weary and how they're tired. We see it in the decisions that are made to drop out or to change up and to do those types of things. Man, we can just grow weary, right? And so today I want us to think about what the Word of God has to say to us in the midst of weariness, in the midst of trials, in the midst of stresses. And I just very quickly want to make two simple points from the text here this morning. So point number one, what are we supposed to do when it is the case that we're overwhelmed and stressed? Number one, the scriptures instruct us here in verse number two through four, they instruct us to wait joyfully and let the Lord cultivate us. In short, in the midst of trials and in the midst of difficulties, the Bible says essentially, wait on the Lord, be joyful in it, and let Him do what He's doing in your life. And this is why this is important. It's important because when you and I face trials and difficulties and circumstances, listen, it's our disposition and our nature that the first thing we want to do, this is why I asked that question, And what do you think you should do about it? The first thing we're inclined to do when it gets tough, when it gets difficult, when we get overwhelmed or stressed out, what we're most inclined to do is try to get out of it as quickly as possible, right? I mean, this is what I do. I've got pressure. I've got stress. I just want to maneuver in such a way that I can get out of it as quickly as I possibly can. When I pray, what I'm praying for most of the time is, God, would you just take this away? It's our disposition. It's the way we think about it that what we ought to do is get out of the trouble. But my question for you this morning is, what if... What if that trial, what if that trouble, what if that stress that when I asked you what's stressing you out, what if that thing that you mentioned in your mind, what if that thing is actually part of God's plan to form you and cultivate you in a certain way? If that's the case, then quote, getting out of it, maneuvering away from it actually shortchanges the spiritual formation that God is trying to accomplish in you. You see, your preparation is much more than just simply 
learning the theological and the tactical things about ministry. Your preparation is just as much, if not more, about the character that you will possess and the character that will show forth when you actually step forward to minister the gospel. In short, if you become a theological giant, but you are spiritually shallow and have the capacity of a flaky person, you're of no value to the work of ministry. So what if that difficulty, that stress that I just asked you about, that you said, I said, what's stressing you out? And in your mind, you said, well, it's this thing right here. And then I said, and what do you think you should do about it? Probably most of us thought something like this. Well, I should probably try to get out of this in this particular way. And yet, what if God is actually trying to form you, shape you, develop you, cultivate you, and make you more like himself through the trials? This is what James says. Brothers, count it all joy. So I say wait patient or joyfully. Count it all joy. Now, I don't think that what this is saying is that we're supposed to have a smiley face on all the time. I think we can acknowledge that sometimes things just stink. But there can, however, be a perspective that God is providential, that he is sitting on his throne, and that the omniscient one knows what he's doing in my life. And because of that, I can take joy in knowing that he hasn't forgotten me, that he's not unaware of the situation, and that all that I'm enduring is not for nothing. Count it all joy, he says, when you fall into various trials. Scholars like to point out the sort of definite nature of this. It's not a question of if, but when. It's going to happen. And I would suggest to you, it's probably going to happen this semester, and it's probably going to happen a lot. You're probably going to feel overwhelmed. You're probably going to be stressed to the max. And it will be your disposition to quit. The Bible says, knowing that the testing of your faith, watch this. Again, I ask you, what if the stress is actually part of God's plan? To make you whole, to make you complete. Knowing that the testing of your faith, watch what it does, it produces a patience in us. Only by enduring these hardships and these difficulties do I become the kind of person that I'm able to sit back and just be patient and let the Lord do what he's going to do. And now watch verse 4, what he says. And let patience have its perfect work, meaning let God do what he's trying to do in that stress, in that trouble. Let God do what he's trying to do. Let it have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, meaning God wants you to stay put. Not wiggle out of the stress, but stay put in it so that he can do something in you. Listen to what Romans says, Romans chapter 5, verse number 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. It's very similar to what James says. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts and the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We could reference lots of other passages of Scripture. Psalm 39, verse, or 37, verse 1 through 11. It's a big old passage of Scripture. I'd ask you just to write it down and go back and reference it later. But here's the kind of instruction we get from the psalm in the moments of trial and stress. It says things like, don't fret, trust the Lord, feed on his faithfulness, delight yourself in him, commit your way to him, trust in him, rest in him, wait patiently on him. Again and again and again, the Bible talks to us about sitting back and just letting God do what he's going to do. Throughout the Old Testament, the Psalms in particular, we are regularly urged to wait on the Lord, right? There was a theology of and a practice of waiting that in our instantaneous culture is gone. Think about it. In our culture today, you're hungry, you put a hot pocket in the oven. I don't know why you would do that, or in the microwave, but you you hit a button and in one minute you got a hot pocket, right? You can have a meal in one minute. I wanna travel somewhere, I can get on a big airplane, and I can fly in a trip that would have taken months and months in years past. Everything about our life is instant, and therefore we want our spiritual formation to be instant as well. And therefore when it gets hard and it gets difficult and it becomes stressful for us, we're inclined to throw in the towel. And yet, in the days of old in the Psalms, they would talk about waiting on the Lord. What does that mean to wait on the Lord? 
Well, this sermon's not just about that this morning, but let me mention a couple things about what it means to wait on the Lord. Number one, it means that in the midst of difficulties, you don't give up. If you throw in the towel and you walk away, you're not waiting on the Lord. It means that you don't give up. It means that you trust him in times of trouble. Instead of worrying so much and taking matters into my own hand, I I don't give up. I trust him to do great work. It means, thirdly, that I expect provisions from him. I sit back and I wait on him to provide for me what I need. James is going to talk about that in just a second with wisdom. It means, fourthly, that I seek the kingdom even in the midst of trials. Listen, here's here's my question for us. What if... The trial itself is part of your journey and part of your spiritual formation. I used to say to a lot of the young folks I used to mentor and disciple back in North Carolina, they'd get stressed. Maybe it was finances that stressed them. Maybe it was a new marriage that was stressing them. Maybe it was their job that was stressing them. Listen, the things that stress us and cause us trouble and anxiousness, its name is legion. It's many, right? And here's what I would say to you. Here's, please hear me. There is actually a deep grace to us in the struggle because God is using that struggle to form us. And there will come a day when you stand where God leads you and puts you and you will be able to look back And it will not just be the education you received. It will not just be the opportunities in ministry that you were given. You will look back and it will be that awful job that you hated. It will be that stressful situation with that person. There is a deep grace to you in the midst of the struggle and such that you'll look back one day and you will be able to see that God, the omniscient one, knew exactly what he was doing and nothing was wasted. Nothing was wasted. He used it all to prepare you for this. So number one, wait joyfully and let the Lord cultivate you. That's what you should do. Number two, simple, right here, verse number five, seek wisdom and then trust him to give it to you. Look, we're Baptists. We are not a name it, claim it people. Look, you you can name and claim that God's going to give you a Mercedes if you want I don't think it works that way. We say a resounding no to that nonsense. But this is actually one of these moments in the scripture where there absolutely seems to be some kind of name it, claim it thing going on. What do you need in trials? What do you need in stress? What do you need when you're overwhelmed? Well, you need lots of things, but I can tell you one thing you need a big old dose of, and that's wisdom. You need God to help you navigate it, right? You need to, it almost seems in the book of James here that he switches subjects in verse five, but it's really not. I mean, if you think about it, this makes logical sense that this would be the very next thing he'd say to us. You need to let trials work their work in you and you need to be patient, joyful before the Lord in it. And in it, you need God to give you supernatural wisdom. That's why he says in verse five, if any one of you lacks wisdom, which is all of us, watch what he says here. Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, meaning freely and abundantly, and without reproach. You ever feel ashamed to ask for instruction or guidance from somebody that knows a lot about the thing you're interested in? You always feel like you're going to look like uh, somebody that doesn't really know anything. They might even scoff at you that you would ask such an absurd question. The Bible promises us here that God will not do that when we say, God, I need wisdom. In fact, he'll give it liberally without reproach. He's not going to shrug at you and say, man, you don't know this. Listen, the omniscient one realizes that you're not omniscient. The perfectly wise one realizes that you're, you really like the wisdom. You're like the, we're like the dumb sheep, right? We step into things we shouldn't step in. We eat things and drink things we shouldn't drink, literally and metaphorically. And God, the almighty, all-knowing, all-wise God, knows that we don't have that. And so what does he tell us to do? Ask me. Ask me. I'll give it to you freely. I'm not going to rebuff you. I'm not going to scold you or mock you for it. But now watch this. But let him ask in faith, meaning if you're going to ask him for it, believe that he's going to give it to you with no doubting, 
For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon is given sort of the golden ticket, right? Remember when we were kids and we would always kind of make believe, what if a genie gave you three wishes? Remember this? We'd all wish for a million dollars and we'd wish for a, a nice big car or something. And in the third wish, we would always wish for a million more wishes. Remember this? <laughs> this is what we do. God sort of gives Solomon here that. Ask of me anything you want, Solomon. You, you're asking the omnipotent God for anything that you want. He could ask for power. He could ask for money. He could have asked for fame. He could ask for any of those things. But you know what he asked for? He asked for wisdom. Listen to what Solomon says. He says, I am a little child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. He had just become king. He goes on to say, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. It so pleased God that he asked for wisdom of all things he could have asked for. He asked for wisdom that God gave him not just wisdom, but then gave him everything else as well. Right? We ask for wisdom because we don't have it. So, to put this in the context of the semester and all that we're going through, look, family, family, I just want to urge you, be in the moment and trust the moment. Give yourself to the process and trust the process. Most of all, as we've just sang, just been singing here this morning, all my hope is found in the hands of of Christ my King. So may my life be found in the hands of Christ my King. Give yourself to the Lord God Almighty in the complexities and the stress and the challenge of the season and trust that all of that too is part of your formation. And my dear friend, I can promise you this. I cannot promise you that you're going to make A's I cannot promise you that you're not going to have bumps on the road. But what I can absolutely promise you is two things. Number one, the Lord's got you now. Right now. And you're going to experience it, and you are going to discover that He is good and that He is faithful. And from that experience, you will grow in character. You will grow in wisdom. You will be cultivated and developed into the man and the woman that God's calling you to be. And it will be part of the process that puts you right here. And you will be able to look back and you will be able to say, nothing, nothing has been wasted. Trust the Lord in the process. Father, we love you. And we are grateful that we get to be your sons and daughters. You are our crown, our jewel, our greatest prize. And we are so honored so thankful, Lord, that you've claimed us as your sons and daughters and that you've called us into the work that you've given us. Help us to trust the moment, the process, and most of all, to trust the hands of the one who's called us into it. We are grateful for you. We find strength and hope in you. And I pray that you bless us this semester as we pursue you. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you Thursday.